Hello aspirants, I hope all of you are in good health and doing absolutely fine. On behalf of Eden IS, I welcome you all to this discussion video on general studies paper of Civil Services Preliminary Examination 2024. This video is helpful for all the aspirants who have attempted this year's prelims and also for those who are currently preparing and are planning to take the examination in successive years. Friends, the examination is done and I hope that you have performed to the best of your abilities. In this video, we will try to take a look at the question paper of general studies and we will try to understand how the paper was. We will try to understand from which section how many questions were asked, how these questions were and on a scale of difficulty where we can place these questions. So without further ado, let's get started. But before going into a particular section, it would be helpful for us to take a look at the number of questions related to a particular section in this year's question paper. And let's try to compare that with some of the previous years for a point of reference. So if we take a look at Indian history, art and culture, this year, the number of questions were 9, whereas in 2023, 13 questions were asked from this section. Indian polity and IR saw a slight increase from 14 to 17 questions this year. Geography was a big surprise. In 2023, there were only 9 questions from geography. But this year, the number of questions were 18. Environment and ecology dropped from 21 to 17. Indian economy and development rose from 14 to 18. General science and technology nearly doubled itself from 5 to 10. Current affairs saw a big drop from 24 to 11. So friends, if we rate this paper on a scale of difficulty, I would say that this paper was easy to moderate. Some of the questions can be called as difficult questions or they can be called as tricky. But more or less, the paper was doable and any aspirant who has prepared well might have done well in this question paper. Before we look into a particular section, let me just tell you that I am coming up with my ethics foundation course and essay module. My ethics batch starts from 8th of July and the essay module commences from 13th of July. So friends, now let us start the discussion and we will start this discussion with Indian polity and constitution. Nearly 17 questions were asked from Indian polity and constitution. And if we take a look at these questions, these questions were easy to moderate. Although some of the questions were tricky, but they were doable. Overall, I feel that aspirants have done well in this section. So let's start by looking at the questions of this section. The first question was, with reference to the speaker of the Lok Sabha, consider the following statements. While any resolution for the removal of the speaker of the Lok Sabha is under consideration. The first statement says, he or she shall not preside. Second, he or she shall not have the right to speak. Third, he or she shall not be entitled to vote on the resolution in the first instance. Which of the statements given above is are correct? One only, one and two only, two and three only, one, two and three. Now friends, this was a direct question related to the removal of the speaker from his office. We know that the speaker is the presiding officer of the popular chamber. When a resolution is under consideration which seeks to remove the speaker from his office, the speaker does not preside the sitting that considers that resolution. In simple words, whenever a sitting is conducted which seeks to remove the speaker from his office, the speaker does not chair that sitting. Second statement says that he, she shall not have the right to speak. Now this goes against the principle of natural justice which says that everybody has the right to be heard. So when the resolution seeks to remove the speaker from his office, the speaker has the right to speak and defend himself against the charges that are 
leveled against him. The third statement says, he, she shall not be entitled to vote on the resolution in the first instance. Now see, friends, the speaker generally has a casting vote. A casting vote means that whenever there is equality of votes on a particular issue and there is a tie, the speaker's vote act as the tiebreaker. Now, if we give this power to the speaker, when a resolution is under consideration that seeks to remove the speaker from his office, it would be ambiguous and it would be unnecessary. That is why when the resolution that seeks to remove the speaker from his office is under consideration, the speaker has the right to vote in the first instance like any other member of the Lok Sabha and no right of a casting vote. Therefore, for this question, the right answer was A, which means one only, that whenever a resolution that seeks to remove the speaker is under consideration, the speaker shall not preside, but he has the right to speak and he has the right to vote in the first instance. So, for this question, the right answer was A, as statement was, is only correct. Article 94, Clause C and Rule 179 of the Rules of Procedure and Conduct of Business in Lok Sabha clearly highlights that the Speaker shall not preside over the House when the resolution that seeks to remove the Speaker from his office is under consideration. Let us take a look at the next question. With reference to the Indian Parliament, consider the following statements. A bill pending in the Lok Sabha lapses on its dissolution. A bill passed by the Lok Sabha and pending in the Rajya Sabha lapses on the dissolution of the Lok Sabha. Third, a bill in regard to which the President of India notified his her intention to summon the houses to a joint sitting lapses on the dissolution of the Lok Sabha. Which of the statements given above is our correct? One only, one and two, two and three, three only. Now again, my dear friends, if you take a look at this question, a straightforward question. Anybody who has prepared polity well will be able to attempt this question. This question deals with the dissolution of the Lok Sabha and what happens on such dissolution. The first statement says, a bill pending in the Lok Sabha lapses on its dissolution. Well, that is true. All the bills which are pending before the Lok Sabha on the date of dissolution lapse. So, the first statement is correct. Second, a bill passed by the Lok Sabha and pending in the Rajya Sabha lapses on the dissolution of Lok Sabha. Logically thinking, this also is correct because suppose the bill that has been transmitted to the Rajya Sabha by the Lok Sabha, if Rajya Sabha amends those bill or amend that bill, then that bill will fly back to Lok Sabha and Lok Sabha will take a look at the amendment. If there is a disagreement, there will be a joint sitting. But if suppose there is no Lok Sabha, then such a kind of joint sitting will not be a possibility and that would be a violation of one of the basic rights available to the houses in the constitution. Third, a bill in regard to which the President of India notified his or her intention to summon a joint sitting lapses on the dissolution of Lok Sabha. If the President has highlighted his intention to summon the joint sitting before the Lok Sabha has been dissolved, then such a joint sitting takes place irrespective of the dissolution of Lok Sabha. So, for this question, the right answer was B, which means 1 and 2 only. A bill pending in the Lok Sabha lapses on the dissolution of Lok Sabha, correct. A bill passed by the Lok Sabha and pending in the Rajya Sabha lapses on the dissolution of the Lok Sabha. This is also correct. But joint sitting summoned by the President prior to the date of dissolution of Lok Sabha remains unaffected, notwithstanding the dissolution of Lok Sabha. So, for this question, the right answer was B. Let us move to the next one. With reference to the Parliament of India, consider the following statements. 
prorogation of a house by the President of India does not require the advice of the Council of Ministers. Second statement, prorogation of a house is generally done after the house is adjourned synodi, but there is no bar to the President of India prorogating the house which is in session. Third, dissolution of the Lok Sabha is done by the President of India who, save in exceptional circumstances, does so on the advice of the Council of Ministers. Which of the statements given above is our correct? One only, one and two, two and three, three only. Prorogation refers to the ending of a session. Now, we all know that all sessions of the parliament are summoned by the president. President has the power to summon and prorogue both the houses and dissolve the lower house. So, prorogation of a house by the president does require the advice of the Council of Ministers because Article 74 of the Indian Constitution clearly highlights that the president shall act in accordance with the aid and advice tendered to him by his Council of Ministers. So, statement 1 becomes incorrect. Statement 2 is correct. Generally, prorogation is done when the house is adjourned sign a time. However, the president is free to prorogue the house even when the house is not adjourned sign a time. Adjournment sign a time means that the presiding officer of the house, be it the speaker or the chairman, has decided that the house has stopped its sitting and has not declared the next time then the house will reassemble. So, the second statement is correct. When we look at the third statement, dissolution of Lok Sabha is done by the President of India, who save in exceptional circumstances do so on the advice of the Council of Ministers. This statement is also correct. Article 85, Clause 2, Sub Clause B of the Constitution states that Lok Sabha shall be dissolved by the President. This action is generally taken on the advice of the Council of Ministers, reflecting the practice in parliamentary democracy. However, in exceptional circumstances such as political crisis or when a no-confidence motion is passed by the House, the President may act without such advice. We know that the Indian President, unlike some of the other Presidents in some other democracies, do not enjoy any absolute discretion but he does enjoy some situational discretion and this is one of such instances. So, statement 3 is also correct. Therefore, for this question, the right answer was C, which means 2 and 3 only. The first statement is wrong. Prorogation of a house by the President of India does require the advice of the Council of Ministers. If no such requirement is mandated, then the president may behave like a dictator and may even go against the democratic spirit of the constitution. Let us move forward. Let us try to take a look at the next question. A writ of prohibition is an order issued by the Supreme Court or High Courts to, well we all know that Supreme Court has various kind of jurisdiction and one such jurisdiction is the writ jurisdiction. Under writ, writ jurisdiction, the Supreme Court issues writs. Writs are nothing but judicial instruments. They are in the nature of habeas corpus, mandamus, prohibition, certiorari and cue warrant. So, this question related to prohibition. Prohibition is a writ which is issued by a superior court against an inferior court when the inferior court has assumed jurisdiction which is beyond its constitutional limitation. In simple words, prohibition is issued by a higher court against a lower court, asking the lower court to stop the proceedings in a particular case. If we take a look at the options, then option C says the same thing, the lower court prohibiting continuation of proceedings in a case. So, for this question, the right answer was C. 
let us move to the next question. Consider the following statements. It is the governor of a state who recognizes and declares any community of that state as a scheduled tribe. A community declared as a scheduled tribe in a state need not be so in another state. Which of the statements given above is our correct? One only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. Now, my dear friends, it is not the governor of a state who recognizes and declares any community as a scheduled tribe, but this is a right which is exclusive to the president of India. So, the first statement in that case becomes wrong. The second statement, if we take a look, a community declared as a scheduled tribe in a state need not be so in another state is correct because in every state, a scheduled tribe is declared by looking at historical and other socio-economic reasons. Therefore, the first statement is incorrect, whereas the second one is correct. A community recognized as a scheduled tribe in one state may not necessarily be recognized as such in another state. The recognition of scheduled tribes is state specific and a tribe listed as a scheduled tribe in one state is not automatically considered a scheduled tribe in another state. This is because the criteria and conditions for recognition can vary across states based on regional contexts and historical factors. So, for this question, the right answer was B, which means two only. The first statement is wrong because it is not the governor, but His Excellency, the President of India, who declare that whether a particular group should be given the recognition of scheduled tribe or not. Let us move to the next question. With reference to union budget, consider the following statement. The Union Finance Minister on behalf of the Prime Minister lays the annual financial statement before the Houses of Parliament. Second statement, at the Union level, no demand for a grant can be made except on the recommendation of the President of India. Which of the statements given above is are correct? One only, two only, both one and two, neither one nor two. Now, the Union Finance Minister does present the budget, but he does so on behalf of the government and the government is headed by the President. In constitution, nowhere it is written that the Finance Minister presents the budget on behalf of the Prime Minister. Although in popular parlance, we do refer to the budget and we ascribe the name of Prime Minister to the budget. But in technical terms, if we look at the articles or provisions of the constitution, we will not find any of such kind of thing. The finance minister presents the budget on behalf of the government and the government is technically headed by the president. Although we know that the Prime Minister enjoy the real powers, the nominal powers are enjoyed by the president. So, the first statement therefore becomes wrong. When we look at the second statement, at the union level, no demand for a grant can be made except on the recommendations of the president of India. We know in the budget, there are two kinds of expenditures. First, expenditure charged on the consolidated fund of India, that is non-votable. And the second one is expenditure from the consolidated fund of India. Any such expenditure is possible only through an appropriation act and an appropriation act is passed in the parliament like a money bill. Before entries are made in the appropriation act, it is necessary to present demand for grants. By the way, my dear friends, demand for grants can be presented only in the Lok Sabha. Because in money matters, Lok Sabha matters and Lok Sabha enjoys extraordinary powers in case of money matters. Therefore, no demand for grant can be placed in Rajya Sabha. It has to be placed in Lok Sabha. The second condition for demand for grants is that 
no proposal for a demand for grant can be made without the recommendation of the President of India. So, here in this question, the first statement is incorrect, but the second one is correct. As article 113 clause 3 clearly highlights that presidential recommendation is required for a demand for grant, whereas article 112 says that the finance minister presents the budget on behalf of the government. So, for this question, the right answer is B, it means 2. Let us move to the next one. How many delimitation commissions have been constituted by the government of India till December 2023? Now, this was a straightforward factual question. If you know it, you will attempt it. If you are not aware about it, then you might have struggled. Well, if what is a delimitation commission? A delimitation commission is actually a commission which gives the recommendation on the basis of that delimitation acts are passed. On the basis of delimitation acts, electoral constituencies are created and these constituencies are mostly created by looking at census figures. Okay? These constituencies are then used for returning candidates to the popular house both at the union level as well as at the state level. In simple words, delimitation commission helps in creating the delimitation acts. The delimitation acts create the electoral constituencies which are used for the election of members to the Lok Sabha and the state legislative assembly. So, this question asks how many delimitation commissions have been constituted by the government till December 2023? The right answer was 4. The first one was done in 1952, second one in 1963, third one in 1973 and the fourth one in 2002. So, the right answer for this question was 4. Let us take a look at the next question. The 71st Constitution Amendment Act 1992 amends the 8th schedule to the constitution to include which of the following languages? The options were Konkani, Manipuri, Nepali, Maithili. Select the correct answer using the code given below. The options were 1, 2 and 3, 1, 2 and 4, 1, 3 and 4, 2, 3 and 4. Now, again, this was more or less something that tested your memory rather than your rationality or logic. The 8th schedule of the Indian constitution contains all the languages which are known as Indian languages. In fact, in the civil services main examination, there is a paper on Indian language and only those languages can be picked which are included in the 8th schedule to the Indian constitution. As far as 71st amendment was concerned, it included Konkani, Nepali and Methi, which is another name for Manipur. So, the right answer was A. Mathli was not an inclusion under 71st amendment act 1992. The right answer for this was A. 1, 2 and 3. It means Konkani, Manipuri and Nepal. Mathili was not included through this amendment. Let us move to the next question. Which of the following statements are correct about the constitution? Powers of municipalities are given in part 9A of the constitution. Emergency provisions are given in part 18 of the constitution and Provisions related to the amendment of the constitution are given in part 20 of the constitution. Select the answer using the code given below. 1 and 2 only, 2 and 3 only, 1 and 3 only, 1, 2 and 3. Again, a straightforward question related to which part deals with what? Yes, part 9a deals with municipalities, part 18 deals with emergencies and part 20 deals with amendment of the constitution, the procedure for which is mentioned under article 368. So, the right answer for this question was 
T, it means all the statements are correct. Let us move to the next one. Which one of the following statements is correct as per the constitution of India? Interstate trade and commerce is a state subject under the state list. Interstate migration is a state subject under the state list. Interstate quarantine is a union subject under the union list and corporation tax is a state subject under the state list. This question tests your knowledge about the three lists of the uh, legislation. These lists are mostly included in the seventh schedule of the constitution. There are three lists specifically, union list, state list and concurrent list. Subjects included in the union lists only the parliament can legislate those in state list only state legislature can and those in concurrent list can be legislated by both the union as well as the states. Well, interstate trade and commerce is actually a part of the concurrent list. Interstate migration is a union subject, interstate quarantine is a union subject and corporation tax is also a union subject. When we look at the options, option C appears to be the only option which is mentioned in the correct way. So, interstate quarantine is a union subject, interstate migration also a union subject, whereas in the question it says state subject, corporation tax is a union subject, it is given in the question as state subject, whereas option A says interstate trade and commerce is a state subject, which is a concurrent subject. So, the right answer for this question was C, interstate quarantine is a union subject under the union list. Let us move to the next question. Under which of the following articles of the constitution of India has the Supreme Court of India placed the right to privacy? I feel that if you have done the previous year's question papers properly, this question might have brought a smile on your face. Because I do not know for how many years now UPSC has successively asked this question. In Justice K. S. Puttaswamy versus Union of India case, the Supreme Court highlighted that Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which deals with right to life and personal liberty, also incorporates within its ambit the right to privacy. Right to privacy today is a basic fundamental right, inalienable right, all citizens enjoy that right. Okay? So, the right answer was D. Let us move to the next question. Which of the following statements about the ethics committee in the Lok Sabha are correct? First statement says, initially it was an ad hoc committee. Second, only a member of the Lok Sabha can make a complaint relating to unethical conduct of a member of the Lok Sabha. Third, this committee cannot take up any matter which is sub judice. Now, this question had an element of fact. The options that were given were 1 and 2 only, 2 and 3 only, 1 and 3 only, 1, 2 and 3. Now, if we take a look at the statements, you will see that the second statement does not appear logical because ethics is something that should pervade, that should percolate and we cannot keep the consideration of ethics in silos or in steel frame chambers. Whereas the second statement says only a member of Lok Sabha can make a complaint relating to unethical conduct of a member of the Lok Sabha. It clearly shuns out the right of others to ask ethical questions to any particular member of the Lok Sabha, especially those who are not members of Lok Sabha. And that would destroy the democratic spirit and will also devalue accountability on the part of the members of the Lok Sabha. So, the second statement cannot be correct. This question could have been solved by applying this logic and by using the elimination technique. You see that all the options apart from C has second as an option or the second statement as an option. Therefore, the right answer for this one becomes C. 
if we look at the explanation, statement 1 is correct. In case of Lok Sabha, a study group of the House Committee of Privileges in 1997 recommended the constitution of an ethics committee, but it could not be taken up by Lok Sabha. The Committee of Privileges finally recommended the constitution of an ethics committee during the 13th Lok Sabha. The late speaker Bal Yogi constituted an ad hoc ethics committee in 2000, which became a permanent part of the house only in 2015. Statement 2 is incorrect and I have already extended the logic behind that. Statement 3 is again correct. The ethics committee generally avoids taking up matters that are sub duties. Even if you are not aware about the first statement and the third statement, which were more or less factual in nature, the second statement required a logical interpretation from your side. And if you have done that properly in the hall and used the elimination technique, then you could have easily got the answer, which was C in this case. Let us move to the next question. As per Article 368 of the Constitution of India, the Parliament may amend any provision of the Constitution by way of addition, variation, repeal. The options were 1 and 2 only, 2 and 3 only, 1 and 3 only, 1, 2 and 3. Well, amendment of a provision of the Constitution means what? It means that you can either add new articles or you can add words to an existing article, clauses or sub clauses in a particular part, etc. So, addition is correct. Variation means you can change the nature of the text of the article that is also possible through an amendment and repeal means simply deleting a particular article or a part of it or a clause or sub clause. So, all three things can be done through an amendment. Only thing is that you have to follow the procedure prescribed under Article 368 and you should not violate the basic structure of the constitution. So, for this question, the right answer was D. Everything could be done. Let us move to the next one. Which of the following statements are correct in respect to money bill? Article 109 mentions the special procedure in respect of money bills. A money bill shall not be introduced in the Council of States. The Rajya Sabha can either approve the bill or suggest changes, but cannot reject it. Fourth, amendments to a money bill suggested by the Rajya Sabha have to be accepted by the Lok Sabha. Again, you see, as I told you that in money matters, Lok Sabha matters or the house of the people enjoys extraordinary powers as far as money bill is concerned. Article 109. Yes, it highlights the special procedure that you have to follow when you try to pass money bill in the parliament. Now, this procedure is like the money bill can be introduced only with the recommendation of the president. It can be introduced only in the Lok Sabha. The Rajya Sabha cannot amend the money bill nor can it reject the money bill. It can only suggest recommendations on the money bill. But those recommendations regarding amendments are not binding on the Lok Sabha because in money matters, Lok Sabha matters. So, when you look at these statements, you see that the first statement is correct. The second statement is correct. The money bill can only be introduced in the Lok Sabha and not in the Rajya Sabha. Statement 3 is correct. When a money bill is passed by the Lok Sabha, it is transmitted to the Rajya Sabha for its recommendations. The Rajya Sabha must return the bill within 14 days, either with its recommendations or without any recommendations. The Rajya Sabha cannot reject a money bill. It does not have the power to amend the bill in a manner that includes provisions other than those related to matters specified in Article 110, Clause 1, whereas Statement 4 is incorrect. Because statement 4 said that amendments to a money bill suggested by the Rajya Sabha have to be accepted by the Lok Sabha. That is not true. Okay? The amendments suggested by Rajya Sabha are not binding on the Lok Sabha. First, Rajya Sabha cannot amend the bill. It can only give recommendations on the money bill. But such recommendations are also not binding on the Lok Sabha. 
So, the right answer for this question was C, it means 1, 2 and 3, the fourth statement was incorrect. Let us move to the next question. The North East Council was established by the North East Council Act 1971, subsequent to the announcement of NEC Act in 2002, the council comprises which of the following members? The governor of the constituent state, chief minister of the constituent state, three members to be nominated by the president of India, the home minister of India. The options were 1, 2 and 3 only, 1, 3 and 4 only, 2 and 4 only, 1, 2, 3 and 4. Well, the North East Council is not a constitutional body, but it was created under the North Eastern Council Act 1971. It is created mostly with the intention to create a kind of bonhomie and cooperation between all the eight northeastern states. So, when we look at this question, all these statements are correct. Northeast Council is under the administrative purview of Ministry of Development of Northeast Region. Home Minister is the ex officio chairman of the NEC. NEC is not a constitutional body, but a statutory body established under the Northeastern Council Act 1971 as amended in 2002. It is the nodal agency of the economic and social development of the Northeastern region, which consists of the eight states of Arunachal, Assam, Manipur, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, Sikkim and Tripura. The council comprises governors and chief ministers of constituent states and three members nominated by the president. So, there was an element of fact in this question, but if you have prepared your polity well, this question was not very difficult, okay? a straightforward question, a question which can be expected in the question. Let us move to the next one. Who was the provisional president of the constituent assembly? before Dr. Rajendra Prasad took over? It is a straightforward question, a factual question again. See, the constituent assembly, obviously we know it was created to create the constitution and the constituent assembly was like the super parliament. So, the super parliament should have a presiding officer. Obviously, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, he was the presiding officer of the constituent assembly, but like we have the uh, the tradition of appointing speaker pro tem before the speaker assumes his office. Similarly, before Dr. Rajendra Prasad was elevated to that position, Dr. Sachidananda Sinha acted as the provisional president of the constituent assembly. So, the right answer for this question was option D. So, that was the polity section, my dear friends, a section which was easy to handle or you can say relatively easy to handle. Those who have performed well in this section, I feel their chances are bright now in the examination. Let us pick the next section which is geography. 